I can remember when 105, our road up the way, had less on it. I can remember when a gallon of bleach was only 99 cents. <laughs> I can remember having public pay phones in different places and you could make a call for just a dime. I remember when there were only five TV stations. Yeah, it's true. There were three networks. The fourth station was called Public Television and the fifth station was called UHF. Things change, right? Things change over your lifetime. The way you look has certainly changed, right? You do not look the same as you did 20, 30 years ago. Have, I mean, have you looked in the mirror lately? Do you recognize that person? That's a, that's a real positive way to start off a sermon, isn't it? But uh, things change, right? Things change. Sometimes they change for the good, sometimes they change for the bad. But do you know what never changes? God, right? Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And do you know what else never changes? God's love for you. The Bible says that God has unconditional love for you. That means his love is reliable, it's unchangeable, it's consistent, it's steadfast, it's unwavering, it's enduring. That is good news, isn't it? Isn't, it that, isn't that good news? I mean, that's, that's the gospel message, that God isn't angry with you, that he doesn't need you to appease him with some sacrifices. He loves you right now, and he will never love you more than he does right now. He will never love you less than he does right now. His love is everlasting. The old temple model of religion said that God demanded a sacrifice. God was always angry and his wrath needed to be averted. There was some sort of ritual that you had to do to make things right with God. You could pray, you could attend worship, you could read the sacred texts, you could confess, but Jesus came, he died on the cross, and that one act became the last ritual. It did. He made things right with God because he knew that we never could. Peter says it the very best in 1 Peter 2. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Because of Christ, the wound that you suffered from sin has been healed. And so, because he died, we have died to sin. That means we, we turned our back on it. We now live for righteousness. This summer, we've been looking at the great commandment from Jesus. Matthew 22 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we've been just beating this drum every single week. Christians are called to be lovers. We are to be known as lovers. We are to have a reputation as lovers. The great commandment says, love God. This is your vertical relationship. And love others. This is your horizontal relationship. And, and we love to love God, don't we? We love to love God. That's, that's why we're all here right now. We, we love God. He loves us unconditionally, forever. That's great, right? It's great, but God says, yes, and now I want you to love each other with that same kind of love. What, what kind of love is that? Unconditional. A love that lasts. That's hard. I, I mean, is it okay if I, if I just receive unconditional love from God but give out 
conditional love? Is that all right? Because I would rather uh, only love my neighbors. I would rather only love those who've earned my love. I'd rather only love those who are easy to love. I'd rather only love those who, you know, try and put in the effort. Besides, my, my love is pretty special, and uh, I'd rather they, they earn it. God says, no, no. You need to love others with my kind of love. And God says through the prophet in Jeremiah 31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. You could build your whole life around that one verse right there. God is faithful to you. His love is everlasting. That's how he loves you, right? But how does he ask us to love each other? John 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another. How? As I have loved you. Our sermon series for the summer has been out with the old and in with the new. We've been saying that Jesus' church is new. It's a new thing. This is, this is a new way to worship. But to ask his disciples to give an unconditional love to the world, that is also new. Nobody had ever done religion like that before. Jesus' church is a brand new thing. It's a new way to worship. It's also a new way to love. Out with the old, in with the new. I don't know what the out is for you. That's up to you. I, I think you have to examine yourself and you need to decide in your own life what, what's out. You know, that's, that's the change that takes place in our lives and in our heart. And it's going to be different for you uh, than it is for me. But the new, the new is the same for both of us. The new is the same. It needs to be love. We need to be loving Christians. We need to be a loving church. And, and there's, no, there's no loophole. There's no way around it. This is a command, right? This is a command from God. So if God loves us with an everlasting love and he wants us to love others the way he loves us, how then do we love with an everlasting love? According to the latest poll numbers, it's hard to stay in love. Approximately 40 to 50% of first marriages end in divorce. The divorce rate is even higher uh, for your second marriage. Uh, second marriage, approximately 60 to 67% of second marriages end in divorce. But there is some comfort for Christians, it's true. The divorce rate is lower for Christians. It's only 25 to 38%. But still, what do those numbers tell us? It's hard to love someone forever, isn't it? Anyone can fall in love. Falling in love is easy, but how do you stay in love? Falling in love is like falling into a hole, right? Oh, I've fallen in love. But to stay in love for 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, to stay in love, you have to make some tough choices, don't you? Is marriage easy? No. Marriage is perhaps the most challenging adventure anyone can take. Why isn't marriage easy? Because love isn't easy. So when God says, love like me, that's, that's a tall order. That is hard. Because love is not a feeling. Yes, it is. No. Love is not a feeling. Love produces feelings. How do I know love is not a feeling? Because if love were a feeling, God could not command us to do it. You can't force feelings. I can't walk up to you and say, be happy. <laughs> right? Doesn't work. Well, if love isn't a feeling, then what is it? Love is a choice. It's a choice. You choose to love. And if you stop loving, that's your choice. And if you want to make a love that lasts, the Bible says you have four choices. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, 
endures all things. Paul says, do you want to know what an everlasting love looks like? It looks like this. 1 Corinthians 13 is so popular, this passage. People put it on t-shirts, they put it on keychains, they're on, you know, wooden signs in your house. We recite them at weddings. Paul says, love is all these things. And again, it's a tall order. It's tough. Good. Love is supposed to be tough. If it wasn't tough, then it wouldn't be special. If it were easy, it wouldn't be special. When I look at that verse, I think that's the same love that God has for you. So consequently, that's the same love I need to have for others. And the first thing we learn from that passage is right there at the start of verse seven. It says, love bears all things. And bearing all things means a lasting love extends grace. A lasting love extends grace, right? The word bears all is the Greek word stego, and it means to hide or conceal the fault of others. Look at marriage, for example. Let's go back to that. The longer we've been in a relationship with someone, we become more critical of their faults, and we take them for granted. People you've just met, or you know, your friends that you've had for a couple of years, you cut them way more slack. You're, you're willing to look over a lot, but the way your husband breathes heavily is really working your last nerve. I bet he breathes that way on purpose. But you need to choose. You choose to be patient. Paul says, love bears all things, and all means all. Which means you need to cut people in your life a little more slack. No relationship is going to last without forgiveness. Every relationship requires patience. It's easy to show somebody grace once, right? All right, you get one chance. Everybody gets one do-over, right? But the Bible says love never stops being patient. It's always ready to make an allowance. Matthew 18, then Peter came up to Jesus and said, Lord, how often will, I, will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Peter was using the old temple system. There were rules. Everybody gets, you know, so many pa passes, and then after those passes, then you're punished. And what does Jesus say? He says, if the old way was seven times, then I say 77 times that. But Jesus, what if they're, uh, what if their flaws and their uh, just their faults irritate me? Even then, yes, especially then. That's what bears all things means. The very first week we said, we are all a mess, right? They're a mess, and so are you. They put up with all of your mess, so you, you need to put up with theirs. Two sinners cannot make a perfect relationship. Proverbs 17 says, whoever covers an offense seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Ephesians 4 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Look at those words. Are you humble? Are you loving? Are you gentle? You might think you're all of those things. But Paul says, if you don't bear with one another, you're not any of those things. Love is patient. So you can choose to make allowances. Everyone needs allowances. But Jesus, what about when they hurt me, you know, with their words or their actions, even then? Yes, even then. Do human beings hurt each other? Yes. Intentionally? Of course. But also unintentionally. And we forget that sometimes. Our world is super thin-skinned lately. We get hot and bothered, and then we grab our toys and run away really quickly. Not every word or action that hurts our feelings is intentional. We should stop assuming that people intended to hurt us. 
Do you intend to hurt others? Of course not. But I bet sometimes you do. Sometimes we are not thoughtful. Sometimes we are careless with our words. Sometimes we are not paying attention like we should. And we say something that's insensitive. We ignore someone. We forget someone. Sadly, this is why people leave the church. They assume someone intended to hurt them. And they feel hurt. They feel ignored on purpose. Tell you what, the next time you think someone intended to hurt you, or you think your spouse did that on purpose, or you think that coworker just stabbed me in the back, let me give you the best advice. And it comes from James. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. You know what? If you do the first two, the third one takes care of itself. It's true. If you are quick to listen and slow to speak, you will be angry less. Because what do we do when we're angry? We fight. And when we're in an argument, we bring back all the things that that person did that hurt us. We've been stockpiling this. We remember all the things that you've done. It's been this many years since this happened. You've done this, this, this many times to me. We stockpile all of that and then we use it to attack them. We unleash it. Oh yeah, but you did this. Oh yeah, but you did this. Proverbs 17 says, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, love does not insist on its own way and it is not irritable or what? Resentful. If you are stockpiling every little offense, your evidence of what this other person has done wrong, they did this, they didn't do this. Here, let me tell you what this person did. Oh, I gotta call you and tell you, oh, you'll never believe what this person did. That's being resentful. That is keeping a record of wrong. That is not loving. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love forgets mistakes. Out with the nagging, in with the love. I mean, come on. Has nagging ever changed anybody? Ever? Out with records of wrong. Love forgives all offenses. Proverbs 19.11 says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. They snubbed me. They ignored me. Proverbs says, overlook it. But they were rude to me. They were careless to me. Overlook it. Why? Because it's probably unintentional. Why? Because I probably accidentally act that way too. And if I accidentally am rude sometimes, or I accidentally ignore someone's feelings, I'd want them to show me grace. So I need to show grace to others. But Jesus, what if they sin? I think th that's worse, right? What if they sin? What about sin, Jesus, even then? Especially then. We're all sinners, right? We're all sinners. Do I want you to throw my sin in my face? every time I sin and, they, and then you shame me? No. So I would like grace from you. I need to show grace to you when you sin. First Peter 4 says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. How many sins? A multitude. Love covers a multitude of sins. Colossians 3 says, bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Show me any great relationship between two people, and I'll show you two people who have mastered the art of forgiveness. What's the secret? What's the secret to a love that lasts? Forgiveness bearing with one another, right? 
I have to choose. That's a choice. I choose to forgive. I choose to extend grace over and over. It's a daily choice. 1 Corinthians 13 is called the love chapter. And it's such a good example of what love, I mean real biblical love looks like. Let's, let's just read the entire thing, okay? This is starting at verse one. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It, is, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. What's the second thing we learn from verse seven? A lasting love expresses faith. Verse seven says, love bears all things and believes all things. See, love and faith, they're intertwined. Well, of course they're intertwined. English poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, whomever loves believes the impossible. Why? Because love not only extends grace, but love expresses faith in God because God is love. First John 4, 8 says, but anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. God is love. It's what he is, right? It's not what he does. It's not a product of something. It's who he is. God is love. And when we love, it expresses our faith, which means love is evangelism, right? Love is evangelism. In fact, it's the greatest form of evangelism. Evangelism is not going door to door with a briefcase and, and a flyer about your church. Evangelism is showing love, extending love, displaying love. People think, ah, I don't have the gift of evangelism. And what they think they mean is, oh, I'm shy. I'm shy and I don't share the gospel on the, on the train or the plane with, or I don't share the gospel with my waiter. I don't knock on the doors of strangers and invite them to church. I don't have Bible tracts in my glove box ready to give to strangers. Good news, you don't have to do any of that. But you do have to love. And when we show love, when we display love, when we choose to love, that's when we show the world God. Because God is love. I must choose to express love every day. That's a lasting love. The third thing 1 Corinthians 13 shows us, lasting love expects the best. Verse seven says, love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things. Love never stops hoping. Love expects the best. You know, when you're around your family or your friends or your spouse, what are you expecting? I mean, you know them better than anyone. You know all their faults. So you probably expect the worst. Oh, I know how this is gonna go. If you expect the worst in others, or if you expect the worst in yourself, you will get it. It'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just like you, you, you don't change bad behavior in others by telling them that they're bad, right? If I tell my son, you're a bad listener, is that encouraging him to be a better listener? No, it's defining him. I'm telling him who he is. I'm telling him he is a bad listener. And if he hears it enough, he won't change. It's self-fulfilling. But a lasting love expects the best. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, 
the conviction of things not seen. Matthew 7 says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 1 Corinthians 13 says that if you love someone, you are always hoping for their best, for their future, for their life. You believe in them. Choose to expect the best in others every day. Fourth thing we can learn from 1 Corinthians 13, 7, lasting love endures the worst. Lasting love endures the worst. It says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Endures means that love is persistent. It's resolute. Refuses to quit. Stubborn. Love never gives up. Why? Because God doesn't give up. Right? Love endures because God endures. Love is eternal because God is eternal. When you give up on your neighbor, your coworker, your family member, your parent, your kid, your spouse, it's over. The relationship is over. It doesn't matter if they endure. If you quit, it's over. Listen, God's will is that we treat others with the same love that he treats us. And he will never, ever give up on you. Well, I'm not God. So I quit. I quit. I'm tired. I've endured so much pain. I refuse to be someone's punching bag. I'm out of here. I get it. But how does it feel to walk away? Wouldn't it feel better to restore that relationship? Wouldn't it feel better to fix it than run from it? No, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. It's over. I'm tapping out. I quit. I'm not going to put anything else into this relationship. I'm done. If they want a relationship with me, it's on them now. It's their turn. Okay. What, what did they do that was so bad? What did they do? I mean, what was that last straw for you? What was so bad that nothing can come back from this? What's the worst thing? I mean, what, if this were a marriage, okay, let's go back to that example. What's the worst thing a spouse could do to you? Betray you, right? Cheat on you, be unfaithful. That's a hard one. I want you to look at this passage from Hosea. This is Hosea chapter three. God says, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Why? Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods. God tells Hosea, I know she cheated on you. She was unfaithful, but you can choose to forgive her because I forgive you every single time that you are unfaithful to me. Wow. You know why Paul had such wisdom to be able to write, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Do you know what makes him such an expert in love? Because this was how much God loved him. This is how much God loves you. This is how much Jesus loves you. Jesus extends grace to you. He died for you. Jesus shows faith in you. He does because he gives you free will. He lets you make your own choices and he expects the best in you and he never gives up on you. 
but I can't love like that. I'm imperfect. I'm a person, right? I'm not God. I have limits. That, that's, that's too much. My love cannot be unconditional. You're right. You're right. So do you want to know the secret? If your spirit can't love that way, then you need to ask God to put his spirit in you. A love like this sounds impossible, doesn't it? That's why we would rather have conditional love for each other. They treat me poorly, I treat them poorly back. They ignore me, I leave. They hurt my feelings, I give them the silent treatment. We, we are transactional with our love. But God doesn't operate that way. And we say, well, I'm not God, I'm a mess. Okay, so the secret is Christ in you. Christ in you. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. See, the old temple model was a sacred building, a literal temple, and you had to go there to be with God. And if you weren't there, then you weren't with God. And Jesus said, no more. I am moving out of that temple and I am moving into a church. I'm moving into you. And if you want to love like God, if you want to love like Jesus, pray. Pray. Tell him. Allow the Spirit of Christ in you. If you have difficulty loving others, if you have difficulty loving your family, if you have difficulty loving your neighbors, if you have difficulty loving your enemies, pray. Pray. We read Philippians 19, 1, 9, uh, verse through 11 weeks ago. That's how we started this series. We'll read it again here at the close. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. None of us can love like God, right? None of us can love like God. It's hard. It's super hard to have an everlasting love. So pray, pray that your love may abound more and more. Let's pray right now. Lord, what a great reminder that each one here is to be a lover and to learn to love with an everlasting love, to love our neighbors, our friends, our families, with the love of God. It is a hard thing to do. It is a tough choice to make, especially every day, especially with our critical and imperfect spirit. So we pray for your spirit to inhabit us, to find a dwelling within us, to fuel us to love others more and more. May our love abound more and more every day. Help us to see the world like you see it. Embrace the world with your arms. Speak your truth with your lips. Share your love and extend grace. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. And I hope you've enjoyed this sermon series. Of course, we'll start uh, something new in the coming weeks. And we just want to remind you that we are here. We are here. We are a church in Montgomery, Texas. We are the church where you live. And we would love to have you uh, in attendance. I'm sure that you participating and being involved would definitely make our church a little better. 
Uh, we have two services, one at 9.30. It's a traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to take communion. We're going to do responsive readings. It's everything that you remember from church when you were growing up. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. Please come casual, come however you feel uh, the most comfortable. We have a full children's program during that hour as well, from birth all the way through high school. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.